what the work actually is, okay, what it looks like to do this work of recovering your, your, your vagus nerve, you gotta be off drugs. And again, drugs can be anything. They can be, God, anything. Watching TV is certainly can be a drug, but so can working too much. You know, anything can, can function this way. Um, you know, I've talked a little bit about what I had to give up. But, but if you think about it, and, and some people have said to me, you know, this sounds like, you know, it's, it's asceticism. But if you think about how we lived when we were traveling with the gatherers, you know, we had to hunt and forage for every little scrap of food we got. We couldn't go to the supermarket and buy it. We had to actually get our food. Um, so we were hungry a lot, you know? And we didn't have processed sugars or flowers or anything like that available to us. We had sticks and twigs and, and, and squirrels or whatever, you know? Um, so if you think of the ascetic path as sort of reducing so many things, giving up so many things from our modern culture, Really, what we're actually trying to do is get back to what we had abundantly as tribal human beings. We didn't have that much. We didn't have that much that could distract us. We didn't have electricity. We had maybe, we didn't, probably didn't even have candles. We had fire, you know? You could watch the fire and you could be with your people. And these are the things that an ascetic gets back to. But basically, um, the first step is to get away, to, 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 to strip away everything that you use to avoid pain. Right? On the positive side, you know, the sort of proactive side, you start breathing into your belly. Deep belly breathing. My acupuncturist was the first person who taught me how to belly breathe before I even started practicing yoga. Um, deep, deep, full belly breathing. I was very sort of uh, devoted to this practice and did it every day, all day long, for months. But what that does, like you said before, it really gets your diaphragm moving up and down. It gets your organs getting squished, and the vagus nerve has stretch receptors. That's some of the main fibers of the vagus nerve are stretch receptors. They respond and they fire when the, the membranes of the organs are stretched. So when your diaphragm really moves up and down, the organs get stretched and your vagus nerve fires. And so breathing deeply is critical. Um, I, you know, I did targeted body work of, of sort of instinctive types. I, I once paid somebody to massage my belly for an hour and a half. Because I just felt like it needed that was great, and it was really was sort of a little breakthrough moment for me. Also, I did acupuncture with a guy who practiced the Japanese style, and it was, it was terrific in the way that um, it really drew my energy downward. But whatever, you know, everybody's going to find their own way of getting this back. Definitely breathing is huge. Definitely getting off of whatever drugs you use to avoid this is critical. Whatever else happens instinctively it, it is also going to be very important. The last thing I would say about that is that I, I you know, I'm a musician, I'm a singer, I, I write songs, and, and I think it was critical for me to have that outlet, to be able to express what came up when I did this work. Um, and so whether it was journaling or writing or, or music or, or, or whatever, however you express yourself, um, that, that was really important for me. The, the last point I'll leave you with is that there's absolutely no question when you've touched down. There is no question. What it felt like for me, I, just to use another sort of hyper-violent image, was that I, I felt like I was being electrocuted. Okay? I've been doing this work for months and months, really stripping everything away, even down to the last detail of how uh, my behavior was with, with, uh, with people. Like, um, I was with my son's ex, with my, my son's mother, my ex, and we were going to a shrink, trying to figure out how to raise our kid, even though we were split up. So, we were waiting for the shrink. The shrink was late, and, and I said, "Let's, you know, let's just sit in the car and talk." And she's like, "No, I don't want to talk to you." And and that rejection was so powerful for me because I've been training myself to feel stuff for for months and months. You know, I was like raw and totally wide open, and it just hit me like a blast. And but I had also trained myself not to do other behaviors that protected me from pain. Like I didn't say, "Well, forget you." I instead, you know, I didn't let myself say anything or protect myself from the pain at all. But my hands did kind of fly up instinctively in front of my face so I couldn't see her expression, the expression on her face that was rejected to me. Just like little kids sometimes, you might see little kids, they, they can't bear what they're seeing in your face because it makes their hearts and their bellies feel so bad. But it was actually that night that I, at a friend's uh, 
yurt and he held uh, sweats. Um, so we were doing a sweat and, and it was just, for some reason, that day that was the last brick that I pulled out of my wall. And I fell just completely into my belly, into my heart. And for, for long minutes, what I felt was this intense pain in my throat and my heart, which happened to be two of the flat sides of the vagus nerve innervates. And um, the only way that I could feel like, the, the, that I could survive the moment, because it really felt like it was going to kill me with that much physical pain, was to allow that pain to travel all the way through my body. And I think the only reason I could do that was from the acupuncture. There's something about the acupuncture, months and months of that, and feeling that if you guys have ever done it, it just you know it opens up the knotting and channel of your body. Whatever they're called, it allowed me to distribute that feeling, that sensation through my body. So I laid there, physically unable to move. I had absolutely no strength at all. Just completely suffused with physical pain. And when I started to come out of it, when I started to gain just enough strength to be able to sit up, there was another guy in the yurt with me and, and he started asking me questions and I, I just did not have the strength to answer in any way other than with the absolute utter truth. You know, just what was true. And that was my moment of waking up. That was when I touched down. But that's the first step. There's more to the work, but that's the first step. And so you're basically peeling away all the stuff that you use to protect yourself, rightfully so, from pain, so that you can touch down into that pain. So this is why I think most people aren't going to want to do this part, but still it's what, you know, it's what it looks like. What's amazing, though, what was fantastic to me was the very next day, what started happening for me was that radically different things were happening for me neurologically. Like, I used to drive around, you know, having all these sort of imaginary conversations with people in my life. Um, and I still did the same thing the next day. And it's a mental process, but this time, I would start advocating for myself. In these imaginary conversations, I would start taking my own side. And every time I did that, I would burst into tears and cry for like 15 minutes driving around Cape Cod. Um, and when I stopped crying, all of a sudden the world would be completely different. I could smell, I could see with like technicolors, like when when Dorothy goes to Oz and all of a sudden everything's in color, you know. I could smell and I could hear, and you get your senses back. I got my senses back. And and you know, there's physiological evidence that the vagus nerve actually does touch the senses, like we talked about in the anatomy part. Um, I do feel like instead of my instead of my eyes going directly to my brain, they now were going through my heart to my emotional brain. A very different circuit and feels very different. My senses felt completely different. You know, after I would cry, after I would sort of re-settle into my belly every day, every time that would happen, I would feel my senses really coming alive. In addition to that, I would, I felt all these new faculties spontaneously arising. Um, the self-advocacy part was huge and, and there's one example, my, my son and I were driving on Route 6 in Cape Cod, and um, this guy, whatever, he boxed us in, basically. There was a guy to my side, there was a guy in front of me, and I was trying to pass this guy to my right side, and some clown came up behind me, riding my bumper, and totally boxed me in. And I have a guardrail on this side, so I'm completely trapped, there's no out, right? And I am absolutely livid, in my body, you know? And when this guy finally gets over and I pass the other guy, and the guy behind me goes by me, I flipped him up. You know, it was really tweaked about thing. Turns out he's an undercover cop and he pulls me over. And, but here's what happened. This is just a few months after I did this work. He didn't even get a word out. I lit into him for tailgating me, endangering the life of my child, blah, blah, blah. I, I wasn't having any of it. And he, you know, he was in the wrong. So, you know, he had to sort of swallow it. He went back to his car and made me wait 20 minutes. And then he came back and said, well, let's just both agree we learned a lesson. And I said, you know, I didn't learn anything. I hope you learned the lesson. And then took off. But so, I, you know, I started taking care of myself. I started, you know, so many different things started happening. I started being gentle with people and animals, you know. Um, from, from an empathetic, like, God, there's so much other stuff that happened. I've only got time over it, so I've got to go on. But the main point is stuff wakes up. You know, you read any self-help book, and they'll tell you like 12 or 15 things you're supposed to work on to get to 
be a better person. All that stuff happened automatically for me. I haven't worked on myself at all in that way. But I did feel real things happen, change, completely change in my personality. So I think all that self-help stuff comes automatically when you do the bagel reintegration work. Um, what also happened, what happens, I think, is that, you know, what happened for me anyway, is that, that, I, that, that all of a sudden I had all these children living in me that all of a sudden came out of the dark. You know, they, they, they came up and became like crawling out of the darkness, you know. Um, and they needed me, and they were little, they were young, you know, and they were horrified to be living in a 35-year-old body, thinking they were two, you know. And, and they needed to be hugged and tended and cared for and nurtured and listened to. And they all had their own little ideas about stuff, and they all wanted to drive the car too, you know. And um, so there was a very, you know, sort of extensive project that I'm still going through of raising my own parts, you know. And this is part of the work. But it's a wonderful part. I mean, these are your most powerful parts, right? These are the parts that are sensitive and strong and hooked up. So it's a wonderful thing. And plus, you know, raising your own parts helps you raise your kid. Um, one, one other quick thought about that is that, um, you know, like we said, little kids can have very sort of extreme black and white, you know, um, if this person were dead, then I can, I can have the ice cream or whatever kind of ideas, you know. Um, so a lot of thoughts that you, that you may encounter in your own body, in your own mind, that are unconscious, that start becoming conscious, may be very ugly and unpleasant thoughts. What I have found across the board, without exception, is that underneath those ugly thoughts is a beautiful truth. Just sort of like, you know, the guy in the example, the 28-year-old that's a dad, has a kid. If he didn't have a kid, he could be an actor. But what's underneath the thought of the kid not being there is... The, the desire to be the actor, right? And that's kind of nice. The guy wants to be an actor. What's wrong with that, right? So, and if you think back to when we lived tribally, there was no conflict between feeling what you wanted to do as a grown-up and tending to your child as a parent. Completely simultaneous realities that could happen without any effort. Because you lived in a tribe. You were never away from your tribe. You're right there. So if you wanted to garden or sing. You could garden or sing and you'd be thrilled that you were doing what you wanted to do and your kid would be able to see you doing what you wanted to do. Everybody would be incredibly happy and there's no problem, right? You lose that when, you know, New York becomes the place you have to go to be an actor and your kid's in Spokane or whatever. You know, so anyway, but you get to raise your own parts. Um, 